Among the countless atrocities committed by the Nazis and their collaborators, one lesser-known program stands out. A scheme involving the abduction of hundreds of thousands of children and the selective breeding of thousands more. All with the explicit goal of promoting the so-called ideal Aryan race. The strategies employed to encourage such reproduction were diverse, with one of the most peculiar methods being the recruitment of young volunteer women who were tasked with the duty of living in specialized facilities designed for human breeding. This is the untold and sorrowful story of the Lebensborn children. Before we continue, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. Your support means the world to a small channel like us, the aftermath of World War I brought about challenging conditions in Germany for various reasons. Particularly relevant to this discussion, birth rates experienced a staggering decline of around 43% during the decade following the war. This decline was influenced by several factors, including the tragic loss of over 2 million young German men, most of whom were at the prime age for starting families. This demographic loss created a significant issue, exacerbated by the widespread and severe social stigma surrounding childbirth out of wedlock. Notably, the German authorities estimated that approximately 800,000 abortions were being performed annually within the country during this period. While many of these abortions were not of great concern to them, Around 100,000 of these procedures were carried out on women carrying what the Nazis deemed biologically valuable, racial stock, children the regime was determined to have born, regardless of the marital status of the parents. In an effort to address the declining birth rates, Hitler and his associates actively encouraged women in the country who met specific criteria to get married and engage in procreation effectively aiming to have them bear children akin to a Nazi, fetal parasite. To incentivize this, Hitler introduced the Mutterehrenkreuz on August 12, 1938. While the term may seem like a playful jumble of letters to non-German speakers, it actually translates to Mother's Cross of Honor. We're on to you, German and Dutch-speaking friends. The primary purpose of this award was to motivate married German women of suitable background to engage in prolific reproduction, metaphorically akin to a human MG3 machine gun. To this end, there were three well-established award levels, bronze, silver, and gold. There's mention of a fourth tier with diamonds placed on the swastika of the medal, but the specific qualifications for this level are unknown except for a remarkable case of a woman who received it for giving birth to an astonishing 16 babies. The gold level was reserved for women who had at least seven children, while those who gave birth to six were awarded silver, and the bronze level was granted to women with five babies. Regarding the general requirements, both parents needed to be of German nationality and deemed to have good Aryan stock. The mother had to embody certain qualities that were considered essential for a good mother and woman, making her eligible for the award. Additionally, all babies born to recipients had to survive the birth process. Beyond the medal itself, receiving the mother's cross brought various privileges and honors, comparable in some aspects to the recognition given to the country's soldiers. For instance, any member of the Hitler Youth Organization was instructed to salute women who had received the Mother's Cross. Accounts from the book, Youth Glossary National Socialism, Terminology from the Era of Dictatorship 1933 to 1945, highlight the preferential treatment bestowed upon recipients, including the best accommodations, food, clothing, and schooling for their children. The level of respect was akin to royalty, exempting them from waiting in lines and ensuring they received prime cuts of meat at the butcher's shop. It's essential to note that a recipient of the award could lose it later if they were found to have neglected their children, been unfaithful to their husbands, or no longer exhibited the traits of the ideal mid-20th century German woman and mother, as defined by the Nazi regime. However, 
This was just one element of a broader strategy aimed at increasing birth rates among the specific population the Nazis deemed suitable for reproduction. Enter Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, who not only played a significant role in orchestrating the Holocaust but also dedicated his efforts to a disturbing plan. In his spare time, Himmler conceived the idea of utilizing young women as breeding stock for SS soldiers, intending to take their babies and place them in homes that met the criteria of an ideal Aryan environment. Furthermore, he proposed a chilling notion. The abduction of babies from other communities, with the intention of selecting those considered racially valuable and placing them in German homes, while the remaining infants would face horrifying fates, such as brutal experiments or murder. This unsettling perspective epitomizes the mindset of Himmler. Regarding the breeding aspect and the reason behind his focus on SS members, Himmler meticulously nurtured individuals within the SS who, according to his perspective, epitomized the ideal Aryan characteristics. He likened this process to a nursery gardener's attempt to revive a pure and untainted lineage that had been compromised and degraded over time. Starting from the principles of selective breeding, Himmler unapologetically engaged in the process of eliminating men he believed would not contribute effectively to the growth and development of the SS. Ironically, the man leading this endeavor, Himmler himself, did not meet the qualifications he set forth. However, it's essential to acknowledge this point and continue the discussion. In pursuit of this objective, as early as 1931, Himmler implemented a stringent requirement for any SS member aspiring to marry and establish a family. These individuals were mandated to provide documented proof tracing their family lineage back to 1800, with every ancestor on that genealogical tree needing to exhibit Aryan descent. Failing to substantiate this lineage resulted in their dismissal from the SS. Those who met these criteria, along with their potential spouses, were strongly encouraged to have a minimum of four children. However, having thoroughly vetted the male candidates according to their vision of the ideal Aryan men, Himmler still needed to address the need for suitable women and offspring. This is where the Lebensborn E.V., essentially translated as, Fount of Life Association, comes into play. Established on December 12, 1935, this organization served a specific purpose. Himmler elucidated the objectives of the Lebensborn in a directive to his SS on September 13, 1936. The primary goal was to support families that were considered valuable from a racial, biological, and hereditary perspective, particularly those with many children. The organization aimed to provide care and assistance for pregnant women who were deemed valuable in these aspects, following a comprehensive evaluation of both the women and the progenitors' families by the Race and Settlement Central Bureau of the SS. Ensuring the well-being of the children and their mothers was an integral part of this mission. Himmler also emphasized that it was the honorable duty of all leaders within the Central Bureau to become members of the Lebensborn E. V. organization, further solidifying its importance within the framework of the Nazi regime. As a part of these efforts, the Lebensborn offered certain advantages. It provided birthing facilities and other pregnancy-related support for the wives of SS members, a privilege that aimed to contribute to the growth of the Aryan population. However, the program wasn't limited to SS families alone. It was open to any pregnant woman, whether married or unmarried, as long as they met the criteria of possessing good racial stock, ensuring that their baby would also have the desired racial attributes. This approach aimed to discourage the prevalent practice of aborting babies born out of wedlock, but it was contingent upon the racial background of the unborn child. Interestingly, a significant portion of the women who availed themselves of the Lebensborn facilities were unmarried, accounting for approximately 60% of the program's participants. 
Despite these efforts, the desired increase in birth rates wasn't being achieved, prompting the authorities to take a more proactive stance in two key ways. First, they sought to recruit young women willing to engage in anonymous breeding with members of the SS. Additionally, they embarked on a strategy of kidnapping children from conquered territories who met the specific racial criteria they were seeking. In the subsequent discussion, we will delve into the distressing topics of mass child kidnappings, murder, and the existence of the Kinder KZ concentration camp for children. But for now, let's focus on the personal experience of Hildegard Trutz, who can shed light on the specifics of the breeding program. Trutz was a staunch supporter of the Nazi ideology, fully immersed in the Bund Deutscher Mädel, League of German Girls. Like many of her fellow countrymen, she had strong admiration for Adolf Hitler and believed in the vision of a revitalized Germany. It's important to mention that Trutz herself embodied the Aryan ideal, with her blonde hair and blue eyes. She describes being regarded as the epitome of the Nordic woman, highlighting her long legs and trunk, as well as her well-suited broad hips and pelvis for childbirth. In 1936, having just completed her education and ready to embark on her journey into adulthood, Trutz faced uncertainty about her future. It was during this period that her leader in the Bonn Deutscher Mädel made a suggestion, why not give the Führer a child? What Germany needs more than anything is racially valuable stock, this conversation introduced Trutz to the Lebensborn program. After undergoing a thorough background check, she was informed that she could become a breeding partner for SS officers. The program assured her that her needs would be looked after, and she would play a significant role in contributing to her country's objectives. In retrospect, Trutz found the idea quite appealing, describing it as wonderful. To prevent her parents from worrying, she informed them that she would be attending a National Socialism course and living at the facility. This establishment was located in a castle in Bavaria, where Trutz resided alongside several dozen other carefully vetted girls. The process mainly involved demonstrating proof of Aryan ancestry traced back to great-grandparents on both sides of the family. Trutz recalls that the entire place was under the supervision of a high-ranking SS doctor who conducted thorough examinations upon their arrival. They were required to make a formal declaration that their family history had no cases of hereditary diseases, dipsomania, or imbecility. A significant aspect of the program was an agreement that any children born during their time at the facility would be considered property of the state to be raised in institutions with the teaching of Nazi ideology before being placed with suitable families. The living conditions for the girls were quite comfortable, with access to various amenities, including a movie theater. Trutz remembers the food as the best she had ever tasted, and they were not burdened with work, thanks to the presence of numerous servants. In terms of interactions with men, she notes that they were all tall and strong, with blue eyes and blonde hair. The girls were given about a week to select a man whose physical attributes matched theirs precisely. Once a choice was made, they had to wait until the tenth day after the beginning of their last menstrual period to proceed. An interesting aspect is that both parties involved were kept in the dark about each other's real names to maintain complete anonymity. Additionally, the SS officers participating were not solely single men. They comprised a mix of both married and unmarried individuals, selected based on the perceived ideal attributes required for being the male part of the breeding stock for the nation and race. Once the specific day, typically the tenth day after the woman's period began, arrived, a medical examination was conducted after which the women were instructed to invite the potential father of their child to their room for intimate purposes. Trutz describes this experience, mentioning that both she and the father were fully committed to the importance of their mission, leaving them with no shame or inhibitions. 
She also noticed that her partner was very attractive but seemed somewhat lacking in intelligence. Nevertheless, for three consecutive nights, they engaged in the activities, and the man was also involved with other girls in the castle who had chosen him, all happening simultaneously. Consequently, Trutz soon discovered that she was pregnant. After the pregnancy was confirmed, she was transferred to a maternity home to go through the process of bringing her baby into the world. Trutz explains that the birthing process was challenging, reflecting the mindset that no good German woman would consider using artificial aids, such as pain-numbing injections, as seen in what she referred to as degenerate Western democracies. She had the chance to be with her baby for a full two weeks before he was taken away, and unfortunately, she never saw him again. Interestingly, she didn't seem traumatized by this experience. In fact, she contemplated signing up for another round in the program. However, she soon met an officer in the real world and chose to marry him instead. When she shared her involvement in the Lebensborn program with her husband, she was surprised to find that he wasn't particularly pleased with it. Nevertheless, he acknowledged that she had been fulfilling her duty, and they moved on from the topic. Sadly, her baby, along with approximately 8,000 to 20,000 others produced through this method, a far cry from the program's original goal of 30 million in one generation, likely faced challenging lives after the war. While she never learned what happened to her child, it is likely that, similar to most other known Lebensborn children, his post-war life was not particularly positive, as we'll discuss shortly. While the entire program raises significant moral concerns, it appears that, for the most part, the adults who participated did so voluntarily. Although this might not have been ideal, especially for the children born from these efforts, the adults don't seem to have been coerced into participating in most cases. However, it's important to note that many SS men and others did father children with foreign women in conquered lands, and some of these children were considered to have the desired genetic traits and, in certain cases, were also taken into the Lebensborn program, adding another layer to the complexity of the program. As mentioned, since the breeding facilities were not producing enough babies, the decision was made to abduct children from the lands that Germany had conquered, selecting those who seemed to possess the desired Aryan characteristics. Himmler articulated his perspective, stating, given the diversity of populations, there will always be some individuals with valuable racial attributes. Therefore, I believe it is our duty to take these children removing them from their environment if necessary, even through acts of theft or robbery. We must either assimilate this valuable blood into our own people or eliminate it. He also emphasized that the children should be raised in appropriate educational facilities or under the care of German families. The age of the children was critical, not exceeding 8 or 10 years, as it was believed that within this time frame, their national identity could be effectively changed, a process termed final Germanization. This process required complete separation from any existing relatives, and the children would be given German names, with their ancestral history managed by a special office. While these children could potentially come from various locations, Poland faced a particularly unfortunate situation, similar to other instances during the war under Nazi and Soviet rule. It's estimated that a staggering number of around 200,000 children were taken from Poland, surpassing the numbers from any other location. These children were transported in large numbers by trains to various destinations for processing, and it's worth noting that providing sustenance to these children wasn't a high priority resulting in the tragic deaths of thousands before reaching their intended locations. Apart from being sent to more well-known places like Auschwitz, there existed a camp called Kinder KZ, specifically established for young children, especially those of Polish origin. In this camp, these children were subjected to various forms of exploitation, such as child labor, 
with some as young as just two years old. Additionally, some children were subjected to experiments or other forms of violence resulting in their deaths. Regarding the exact processing of the taken children, those who appeared to have desirable attributes were directed to Kinder Zihungslager, referred to as children's education camps. Here, a process of quality selection was implemented, which involved assessing not only the children's apparent racial background but also subjecting them to various medical and psychological examinations. These factors were considered to determine their overall desirability, with additional criteria such as the shape of their skull, the presence and size of birthmarks also taken into account. Ultimately, the children were categorized into three groups, desired, acceptable, and undesired. Subsequently, based on their assigned score, these children were directed to various destinations, ranging from placement with an SS family, enrollment in a boarding school or orphanage, to even the grim possibility of being sent to a concentration camp. For the children deemed biologically valuable, they underwent a process of indoctrination into the Nazi ideology. This involved giving them new German names, teaching them to speak German, and imposing strict consequences for any failures or significant resistance, including the potential of being sent to a concentration camp if they didn't conform. Those who were fortunate enough to be placed with new families were often told that their parents had passed away. However, for those considered undesirable, a chilling account from Auschwitz detailed their fate. These individuals were subjected to lethal phenol injections. In a chilling description, it was noted that they didn't wait for the victims to truly die, but rather, amidst their agonizing state, they were removed and placed in a pile of corpses in another room. The following victim would then take their place on the same stool, adding to the grim and horrifying nature of these events. As the war neared its end and the Allies were about to seize control, many records concerning the origins of these Levensborn children and comprehensive information about the program itself were intentionally destroyed. This act further complicated the efforts to trace the history and provide closure for these children in the aftermath of such a traumatic and tragic chapter in history. Regrettably, this resulted in a heartbreaking situation where a significant portion of the hundreds of thousands of children who were either kidnapped or born as a result of the state breeding program had virtually no means to reconnect with their biological families, with only around 10% managing to do so. Even for those fortunate enough to be reunited, this often became another traumatic chapter in their young lives. Many had spent years with their new families and often retained little or no memory of their previous lives, parents, or relatives. This led to them being uprooted from their homes once again, against their wishes, amplifying their distress. However, amidst this grim scenario, some individuals managed to find somewhat positive outcomes. One such case is that of Gisela Heidenreich, whose mother worked as a secretary for the Lebensborn program and had a relationship with an SS officer during her time there, resulting in the birth of her daughter within the program. Remarkably, Gisela was allowed to remain with her mother. Despite facing derogatory remarks such as being called an SS bastard after the war, Gisela was eventually able to reunite with her father. She found a way to compartmentalize his role and actions, expressing her feelings with simple clarity. When I first met him, it was on a station platform. I ran into his arms, and all I thought was, I've got a father. As previously mentioned, the plight of the children from the breeding programs extended to other regions, such as Norway and Germany itself. These children, and often their parents, faced severe social stigmatization. Reports indicate that the women were subjected to occasional beatings and even had their hair forcibly shaved off. Local communities went to great lengths to ostracize them, attempting to drive them away. This negative perception extended beyond the program, affecting any child born to a German soldier and a foreign mother during the respective military occupations, 
painting them in an unfavorable light. In Norway, an estimated 12,000 such children were born under these circumstances. After the war, some of these children were placed in mental institutions, and there were even attempts to forcibly relocate them to other countries. Like their mothers, they often faced bullying and abuse, creating a hostile environment. Some of them managed to escape this oppression by leaving Norway, and one of the most well-known cases is that of a young girl named Annie Frid Lingsted. Annie Frid's mother, Sinny Lingsted, was only 19 when she had a child with a German sergeant named Aldred Haas. When the war ended, Haas returned to Germany, and Sinny was harshly judged in Norway for having a child with a German soldier, being labeled as a collaborator. To escape this treatment, Annie Frid's grandmother, Arntine, took her to Sweden, and Sinny joined them shortly after. Sadly, Sinny passed away from kidney failure at the young age of 21. Fast forward to nearly two decades later, and that little girl, Annie Frid, grew up to become one of the lead singers of the iconic band ABBA. In the early 2000s, some of the Lebensborn children pursued legal action against the Norwegian government, accusing it of playing a role in their mistreatment. While they ultimately lost the case, the government offered them a financial settlement as a resolution. The story of the Lebensborn children is a haunting reminder of the depths humanity can sink to in pursuit of an ideal, a tragic chapter in the larger narrative of World War II. It reveals the horrifying consequences of unchecked power, warped ideologies, and the immense suffering experienced by those innocently caught in the crossfire. Together, let us stand against hatred, discrimination, and the dehumanization of any group. By doing so, we contribute to a more compassionate world, ensuring that the legacy of the Lebensborn children is one of remembrance, education, and a commitment to preventing such dark times from ever recurring. As always, like, comment, and subscribe. Your support means the world to a small channel like us.